So considering a TSP, we have to make it stationary. So we will detrend it. Okay. Now here I am giving the manual operation of detrending. Yeah. So suppose we have a we have a particular variable, and that variable we have to regress on a trend. We are getting this trend, and then that variable value minus this trend. That is the estimated trend will give us the this is the fitted series 1.39 plus 0.5 t then putting the t values all the t values we will get the estimated by t value then that this by t minus this by t estimated value will give us the detrended value so this is the detrended series okay this is what we do manually, but as I told you earlier, we, need, we can do it in another way also using the fresh bow theorem. So, so fresh, fresh and bow in 1933 suggested that if we include a time trend in a regression, that is equivalent to detrending all the variables by regressing them individually one time. That is what I told you earlier. This is the famous push work theorem in the context of multiple regression. So this is so with the every this is not only not only for detrending. We actually what we do in a multiple regression framework is we are controlling for the effect of other variables if we want to have the marginal effect of one variable on the dependent variable then we control the effect of all other variables so that controlling is like detrending so that is the idea of this now suppose we have uh, uh, two series two type series for example, consumption series and the income series. And I have a, uh, and uh, usually we know if these two data series are over the time, time series data sets, then naturally we have to deflate both the series, right? Then only we, we use the deflated series in regression. That is in a time series regression, the all the value tables, if any variables, any variable is in value chain, then we have to detrend it. Then only we can use that variable in a time series regression. In a time series regression, all the time series variables must be deflated by value in value if they are in value chains. But we need not do the deflation manually. According to friction work theorem. What we need to do there? Can you can anybody tell me? How can we deflate all the series without actually deflating prior deflating them? Anybody? What can what shall we do? Anybody getting any idea? No? Sir, can you please repeat the question, please, sir? The question is, suppose we have in value terms, consumption and income. We are fitting a regression, right? But this is over the time. We have time series data. And we know that in a time series regression, then we should use deflated series only that is we have to remove the inflationary effects from both consumption and income series then those deflated series we have to use in regression that means 
before doing the regression, we have to deflate the series. That is the prior niche. We have first we have to deflate them. Then we do the regression. But according to friction work, we need not do the prior deflation. Rather, how can we do the regression in that case? That is, we are using the nominal values of consumption and income. How can so we what make it in real terms? Ah, so what, so ah, what about how, the gold? Sir, what about the volume, sir? Volume is already a deflated one. Uh, so, if in volume? fact, kind of, uh, sir, if, if in fact, uh, oh. I'm not missing any volume, but I have consumption, okay? Consumption okay, expenditure. Okay. okay. Yeah, consumption expenditure in value terms, in rupee terms, income in rupee terms. And this is time series. Since they are in time series, we know all the nominal, nominal values includes the effect of inflation, right? So to do the, so that means we should, we are having a data set in nominal terms, value terms. We cannot have a time series regression with the value terms or nominal terms. We have to use the real value takes the, the the variables must be in real value takes so we will get the real value takes from the nominal value takes by deflating the nominal values we remove the inflationary effects so the nominal values will become real values so with the real variables real value variables only we can do the regression but according to the Fitchburg theorem, we need not do the prior deflation. We add some variable in the multiple regression and then everything will be taken care of. Sir, is it disposable income? Can you tell me how? Hello? Yeah, disposable income or whatever be, whatever be, disposable income, but it is in, it is in, it is not in real things. Uh -huh. That is the problem. Correct. But correct. A regression, in a regression, we have to use real things. Ah, what is it? It, it see it. Uh, my expenses always depend upon how much I have in my hand. It wow. is an absolute figure, uh, because in uh, when it comes to the figure, even for example, uh, for hundred rupees, ten rupees is ten percent, and for thousand rupees, hundred rupees is a ten percent. But while uh, uh, while 10 rupees and 100 rupees in percent term look same, uh, but uh, the purchasing power of 10 and 100 are totally different. So that is the reason we require absolute value or nominal value compare with respect to the percentage terms. This is what uh, my opinion is. But now, no, my question is different. Now see, if we are using nominal values in a regression, the regression coefficients are inflated ones because the nominal values include the effect of inflation also. So we have to remove the inflation from the, that is we have to deflate the consumption expenditure series and income series. And then using these deflated series, we do the regression. That is the real regression. That is regression on real things. That is the real regression. So how can we do that without deflating initially the nominal values? In the regression equation, in the regression framework, we are using nominal values. But along with the nominal values, we are using some other variable so that we will get the result of deflation automatically. Any idea you are getting? See, take the case of the, 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 this particular one. How do we detrench? In a regression, how do we detrench? We are including a time. time trench in a regression. That is key. Time. One, two, three, four, five. That's time we are including in a regression. In the presence of that time variable, will detrench all the variables in the regression. Similarly, if we have Consumption as a function of income, consumption expenditure, 
consumption expenditure then income along with the income assigned to independent variable we include another variable so that both the consumption variable and income variable will be deflated so which variable we will use so is it the price index or something like that of course the price index either we use the price index or we use the inflation rate as such what idea if we include an inflationary tail inflation tail in the in the in the equation along with nominal values of consumption expenditure and income then the regression will be all real tails because the presence of inflation will deflate both consumption expenditure and income so that we will be getting a real regression so that means we need not go for deflating the time series values first we just include a, an inflation rate either a price index or the inflation tail as such that will de that will deflate all the series all the value tails within the regression that is the beauty of Fritz and Bob theorem so good idea so hereafter if you if you want to find a time series in a time series you have the you have say for example returns you have returns returns over the time you have to find if you want to find the real returns similarly you have exchange rate if you want to get the real exchange rate then along with the return nominal returns and nominal exchange value you put a regression you put a inflation variable either the price index or the percentage change of that or the log difference of that then the regression will be will be about the real terms of returns real returns and real exchange rates so that is the fresh book theorem what it now the the residuals we get from including a time trench is usually interpreted as the cyclical components in business cycle theory or we use it for estimating the trench growth rates okay is it clear I think so. Okay. Now, so we know that for a stationary series, no, sir. We have the we have a zero mean, and if we have an intercept, then the mean value will be equal to that intercept a. Then variance of y is a constant. Covariance also is a constant. They are independent of them. That is the property of a stationary process. Sir, hello. No. Sir. Ah, ah, hello. Sir, sir, do you have any doubt? Sir, uh, can you please, please what explain is it? how? It, sir, hello. Ah. Sir, ah. I didn't get the point, sir. How to use the values in real terms while put, uh, while regressing income on consumption? You said. We are regressing consumption for income. Okay, the yeah. consumption expenditure is in is in money terms. Okay, and uh, income also is is in money terms. That is what we say value terms, right? Yeah. And uh, if we have the time series data over the time, we know the prices are increasing. We have a we have inflationary effect. effect in that. Yeah, so the consumption expenditure and income series will will be including those inflationary effects. What the idea? Yes, sir. Yeah. So if we if we regress this nominal value series, then the the estimates that we get will be inflated because of the presence of inflation. 
That is not the real. That is not the real estimate. What the idea? Yes, so we sir. have to remove. We have to remove. We have to deflate. We have to remove the inflation from this series. That is, we have hmm. to deflate it. Yes, sir. So to get the real regression, we have we have to use deflated series. Now hmm. earlier, earlier before fresh war came to the scene. Earlier econometricians were doing a lot of calculations like this. That is, first we, they will deflate one series, then they will deflate the other series, then using the deflated series, they will do the regression. Now, Frushchenko told them that this double work is not needed. Mm -hmm. We can do one regression by including inflation or price index in the As regression equation yeah it will be the all the variables will be different but sir there will be a simultaneous problem again there may be the possibility of uh, multicollinearity between the variables see in a time series in a time series uh, uh, regression there, sometimes there may be the problem of multicollinearity but remember Multicollinearity is not a major problem. We can just just cross our eye towards that, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Ah, what is it? Somebody was asking. Sir, I have a ah. question. Uh, do you mean to say in ah. the time series analysis uh, we don't have to worry about the multicollinearity? When we do um, a multi regression, <laughs> no, multiple regression. Right. Uh, so you remember we... in the last class, I, yeah, in the last class, I showed you an example, right? Yes, sir. See, yes, sir. if there is, if there is any serious multicollinearity problem, what we have to do is we remove the, remove one of the variables, right? But yes, sometimes yes, if we remove the variable, the model will not become adequate. Okay. We will have the specification problem. Right, sir. So the specification problem is more dangerous than multicollinearity problem in consequences. So we have no other way than watch, ignoring multicollinearity. That is why it is given as the last one. Just ignore it. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank what you. Right. Sir. Ah. Can, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one thing can you explain, sir? Every time series is either a TSP ah. or a DSP. So, right. uh, so for every time series, we have to first detrend it and then uh, we have to estimate it sir now see every time series may be either a dsp or a tsp or both okay yes sir okay in dsp also we can have a deterministic trend so so in 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 finding unit root Therefore, we will have several options. If we have a trench, then we have to remove the trench and find whether there is a, a unit root or not. There are some options. When we come to the uh, unit root case in the workshop, I will I will show you that. Okay. So we have so that and means we can determine you... by including, including a time variable. Ah, what is it? Sir, and you will show us in Gretel how to retend it, no, sir? Oh, yes, oh, yes. We will, we will do in the afternoon that. Okay, the you will do test and uh, integration, everything, I will show you. Thank you. So, if, if there is any trend in a variable, first we have to detrend it. For detrending in the, in the unit root test framework, we include a time trend that will be that will be trended right thanks to fresh work here yeah so that, that procedure is there that i shall show you okay now 
Now let us let us see the, the consequence of unit rules. Why non stationarity is a problem in regression? Now we know that as stationary time series, we can ex express in terms of a regression model with fixed coefficients. So the coefficients are to be considered fixed. However, the OLS estimator in the presence of a unit root cannot have an asymptotic distribution. See, asymptotic distribution means the distribution of the OLS estimator as time increases infinitely. Asymptotic means as time increases infinitely. Now, why if we say that the OLS estimator in the presence of unit roots does not have an asymptotic distribution? Now, we know that the OLS estimator from a regression of YT on XT, we can estimate using the ratio of covariance of YT and XT divided by the variance of XT. That is the formula. Covariance, covariance divided by variance of X. Now, suppose YT is stationary variable and XT is non stationary variable. Then, what will happen? The OLS estimator from the regression of YT on XT will converge to zero asymptotically because variance of XT is a function of T. And it increases infinitely with time. We know that for a non stationary variable, variance of that variable is a function of time. Here, xt is non stationary. If xt is non stationary, then its variance is a function of time. And in the OLS estimator equation, covariance divided by variance of xt. This variance of xt will increase with the time, over the time. As, in, as time increases, the variance of xt will also increase and the regression coefficient will theoretically, okay, in the theoretically it will converge to zero. It cannot be considered a fixed coefficient. But a regression, in the regression framework, we need a fixed coefficient. Theoretically, this is not possible if we have a non-stationary variable in our regression. So that is why we say that the wireless estimator does not have an asymptotic distribution. What the idea? Um, sir, sorry okay. to interrupt. So uh, if, sir, uh, no, sir okay. sorry to interrupt you uh, over it. here. Yeah. Can you please uh, uh, explain this with an example, sir, like uh, 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 one uh, uh, variable which is stationary and a non-stationary variable with an example, if you can explain, I think that would be uh, more clear. Suppose you see most of the most of the macroeconomic variables are non-stationary. Stationary variables are very rare. Some of the variables are there. But, but most of the variables are non-stationary. If we have both the variables non-stationary or one of the variables non-stationary, then we will have this problem. Because either the covariance will be increasing over the time or the variance will be increasing over the time. In both the cases, theoretically, the OLS estimator cannot be considered constant, fixed. What the idea? Uh, yes, sir. Is it clear? Uh, so, uh, yes, sir. So you mean, to, yeah, uh, uh, you mean to say that if we take macroeconomic variables, most of the time they are non-stationary, but uh, if we are taking yeah. any uh, uh, stock prices of a company or maybe a stock indices stock. that we take, uh, then it, it could be stationary. And then uh, during that time, uh, we are going to... Um, Check the, I mean, this OLS uh, estimator cannot. Uh, See, whatever, whatever be the case, if we have a time series variable, we have to see whether 
there is a unit root in that variable. If there is a unit root, then there is a problem with the regression like this. So we right. have to remove the unit root. Right. We have to remove the unit root. Right. That is the idea. So usually the, the stock price index is non stationary And if we take the difference of that, log difference, that is the returns. The returns are usually stationary. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Now I understood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this is the consequence of the non stationarity. We cannot expect a constant or fixed OILS estimated from the regression of non stationary variables. Now, I am giving an example. This example is a uh, is is widely quoted one and uh, this was this particular example as a Monte Carlo experiment was done in 1974 by two econometricians greater and newbold i will come to them after some time now suppose we have two unrelated antibody processes that is yt see the coefficient is equal to one the root is equal to one and this the error time, random error time is independently and identically distributed as a normal variable. Similarly, we have another one, xt, another random variable where the, the, the new error time is y t, random walk. Okay, so we have two random walk processes. Now, along with this, we have an additional assumption that the covariance between ut and vt is zero. There is no relationship between these two. If there is no relationship between these two, then yt and xt must be unrelated. They must be independent of each other. Okay. Now, suppose we fit a regression of yt on xt. We are fitting a regression of yt on xt. And we know that yt and xt are two unrelated random walk series. There is no way we can have a valid regression. But now what will happen? We know that if there is no relationship between yt and xt, the aspect from this regression must be around zero. It must tend to get zero, close to zero. But what will happen when we do this? Here, I am giving the example. I told you it was the 1974 Monte Carlo experiment by Granger and Newbold. They got very highly asked and highly significant T values. That is an asked value very close to one and to very, very high T values. That means the regression as a whole is highly significant statistically, but they got a very low DW statistic. But if, where, where do we use the DW statistic? For finding whether there is any autocorrelation among the residues or in the error table. That is the whether the no autocorrelation assumption of the error table is violated. To test that, we use the DW statistic. Here they got a DW statistic that is close to zero. Now what they did is they run, run the regression in first differences. That is, they difference them both by T and XT. And we know by differencing they will become they become stationary. Now what happens is the when they regress ditch the differences. They got an aspect value close to zero and the DW statistic close to two, indicating there is no autocorrelation. The model is adequate. Aspect close to zero means that there is no relationship between yt and xt, what we expected. So, the high aspect that we obtained earlier was just spurious. So, the, this the earlier regression was a spurious regression. So, 
Greater and Leopold is suggested that whenever we have a case where R squared is greater than DW statistic, then we have a case of spurious regression. That is invalid regression. We cannot we cannot depend on that. That is, we have to make the series stationary and then do the regression. Then only we will get the valid regression. So, this is the case of the spurious regression I told you earlier. You remember the last day I told you about the spurious regression. So, remember this particular suggestion by Granger and Newbold that is, whenever R squared is greater than DW, the equation is spurious. Now, next time when you attend any seminar and uh, somebody is presenting a paper with uh, a very time series data, very high R squared, and uh, we know that whenever we have a very high R squared, we will be very happy because the model explains the the our model explains the variation in our in the very in the dependent variable very 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 highly. So we will be very jubilant about that. So getting an R squared is is getting he is, is 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 very much happier for us. So next time when you attend a seminar and somebody is reporting or very high R squared, ask him what is about what is about the DW statistic. I told you earlier there is a practice of not doing or not reporting the results for the model adequacy test. One must do that first. At least the DW statistic must be there. So that we can find out whether the model is not suffering from autoregression. So next time you ask him, where is your DW statistic? And ask to compare that. And, and you have to educate him if the R squared is greater than DW statistic, that the results you obtain is a spurious one. It's nonsense. Now, actually, there is a difference between nonsense regression and spurious regression. I shall come to that shortly. Ah, it is here. Is it spurious or nonsense regression? Now, this, uh, there is a long standing puzzle over high correlations between what ought to be unrelated time series variables. For example, the high positive correlation between the murder rate and membership of the Church of England. This was the study done by Yule in 1926. I told you about George Utney Yule, who from whom originated the autoregression process. In 1926. So in 1926, he did a study on the correlation between the murder rate and the membership of the Church of England. He collected time series data on murder rate and membership of the Church of England. And he got a very high positive correlation between the two variables. Now, can we can we take that that high positive correlation in its face value? So there is a problem, right? We cannot expect a positive correlation between the murder rate and the number of Christian devotees of Church of England. And therefore, he classified the correlations or regressions in two types, nonsense regression and spurious regression. And the nonsense regression is the one that we get from the integrated but mutually independent time series. That is, we have high serial correlation in each series, very high correlation. The spurious regression we get with the variables depending on a common third factor, such as a linear trend. So, what greater and Newbold called a spurious regression is actually a nonsense regression in the language of Yule. Because the, the, the so-called spurious regression of Granger and Newbold is obtained out of integrated time series. 
because of very high serial correlation among the residues. Got the idea? And spurious regression happens when the variables, all the variables are depending on a tech factor. That is some other factor. For example, a linear trend. In the case of the above one, that is the high positive correlation between the water rate and the membership of the Church of England. In both the cases, we have a linear positive trend. Murder rate is increasing over the time. There is a positive trend. Membership of the Church of England is increasing over the time. There is a, there is a positive trend. So, the correlation that we get between these two variables is actually the correlation between the two trends. Now, what Joule did is he removed the trend from these two variables and he got Hello, a close to zero correlation between the variables. Hello, sir. Got the idea? Ah. Sir, in the example you so, said. Huh. Sir, in the example, you said that income and uh, consumption, when we are regressing consumption on income, then mm. there is a common factor uh, that is inflation. Mm. If we consider inflation as an independent... Yeah. If we, if we consider inflation as an independent variable, then the problem is solved. Yeah, that is, we are, if, we are deflating for the series. Exactly. If we do not consider yeah. inflation as an independent variable, will yeah. it be a problem of Fourier regression in that case? Of course, because because see, if, if we find if we find that uh, there is unit root in the series, then it is said it, it, it then the both the series are integrated. Hmm. Got it? All the series yes, are sir. integrated. So there is a problem of nonsense regression in the in Jules language or spurious regression in Granger New Gold language. Actually, this Davis in time series econometrics, this these two differences are not kept. Both the nonsense regression and spurious regression are used, these two terms are used interchangeably. So in general, instead of the nonsense regression, we are using in, we are following the greater new world terminology. That is the spurious regression. Actually, there is some difference between these two. The spurious regression usually we get if there is a third variable affecting the two variables. A other factor, a third factor or we say other factor. The nonsense regression we get from the integrated non-stationary series. But unfortunately, we do not distinguish these days between these two cases. We say spurious regression and that is related to only the integrated one. The other one we have not considered. Sir, what idea? A second. is it clear? Sir, yes, sir, ah. yes, sir, it is clear. Ah. Sir, you are saying that income ah. and consumption are somehow integrated. Sir, should they be integrated of the same order or they may be integrated of some other orders even? Maybe we have they... to check for the, the order of the integration. We have we have to do the unit root tests. Okay. So sir. otherwise we cannot tell. Some usually the national in national income figures in some context, in the case of some countries, the national income or the consumption series are integrated of order one, but in some cases we find that uh, there are two unit groups. So it varies. So we have, first we have to see whether the, the uh, that is, first we have to see the order of integration. Okay? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. So now here, I am giving an example, income and consumption. So here we are regressing consumption on income and getting, see the the, the P values are zero. That is, they are very, the T values are very, very high. 
So we are getting a highly significant model. And as per DC 0.9975. So one will one will dance if one gets this particular asteroid. It's very close to one. And the F probability value also is very, very the also is zero. But the question is now see the double version test. It is 0.68. It is 0.68. And that is less than our aspect. So this is nothing but a spurious regression. Anyway, I wanted to ask you whether this is this regression is a spurious one or whether there is a genuine long run relationship between these two variables. I have already told you the case. It is a spurious regression in the language of Granger and Newborn. Otherwise, it is a nonsense regression. Now, if we first difference both the variables, now see the probabilities. Probabilities are very, very high. The p values are very, very high. R squared is close to zero. And the DW statistic close to the model is adequate. But there is no relationship between the two variables as expected. So this is the case of the spurious regression. Now here we have the time series plot of income and the consumption. And here we have the difference the variables. Both income and the consumption are non-stationary and the delta the, the difference series are stationary. So it is very essential that we check for stationarity of the time series. The classical approach of evaluating stationarity is, as I told you earlier, in terms of the autocorrelation function, that is ACF, the polygram. If we have fast de decaying ACF, that's an indication of stationarity. The modern procedure is to go for unit root tests. We have Dickey Fuller test or augmented Dickey Fuller test, then Phillips per own non parametric test, and so on. We have a large number of unit root tests, maybe more than 100. More than 100. But some of these tests are available in packages, especially the ADF. Usually, we do this ADF, even though for all the tests, the power is very, very low. As expectation. Now about the choreogram, I have already uh, given some indication of choreogram earlier. So this is a stationary series because the autocorrelation coefficients are fast decaying. And in this case, they are not fast decaying. Ah, here also we have fast decaying. Okay, this is this is a non stationary time series. ACF is very slowly decreasing. So, up to this lag, it is not decaying. Okay. Now, there is a question of choice between differencing and detrenching. We have seen that if we have a DSP sir. series. Sir. Ah. Sir. Come on. Uh, sir, actually, I hmm. come through a paper of Madala and Wu. In that paper, sir, say, ah. they have said that uh, like Philip ah. Peron and EDF tests are not uh, that much powerful test of testing a unit rule. Ah. Ah. They suggest ah. rather yeah. using yeah. an NG, yeah. NG, NG and Peron test and other tests are more useful in compared to them. But they don't provide yeah. uh, any rigorous discussion on that okay. that how ng parent test uh, qualifies better than the adf or pp test sir can you emphasize on see, that particular see, issue see as i told you earlier most of the tests are with very low power even this the test or kpss unfortunately the test that we do cited are not available in any package mm. but to some extent, the KPSS 
there is a there is a test with the, the null hypothesis of stationarity. In all other cases, we have the null hypothesis of no stationarity. Unit root. The KPSS yeah. test is has a, a null hypothesis of yeah, stationarity. Yeah, hadri, 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 and those few, actually all these more than 100 tests are with very less power, very less power. Whether we take ADL for PP or KPSS, all these tests have very, very low power. We know, we actually we know whenever, whenever, whenever we have, whenever we specify a, an alpha significance level, then corresponding to that, there is a loss of power, right? The problem is there. We are fixing the, the alpha or the significance level initially, and we are going for only very, very, very low alpha. And very low alpha means very low power comes. So every test, every statistical test has this problem of the, the, the trade-off. There is a trade-off between power and size. Size means alpha, the, the significance level. There is a trade-off between these two. And that trade-off trade -off, trade -off cannot be actually eliminated. If you go for a small size, small size of test for alpha level, significance level, then there will be very, then, then the beta, corresponding beta will be very high. high. Beta is the the probability of type committing the type 2 error. error. That, yes, uh, type 2 error. That will be very high. That means the power will be the power of the test will be reduced. Very low. Power of the test will so be reduced. So it so happens. It so happens. Since since we do not have since we do not have a powerful test, we have to be satisfied with the whatever is available through our packages. That is the problem. But now remember in, in R there are provisions for writing a program of your own with, with a high power, but with a, the, the high power at the same time will have a high alpha level also. That is the problem because these two, between these two there is a trade-off. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. No. Now we know that whenever we have a DSP, we have two difference. Whenever we have a TSP, then we have two deep branch. Okay. Now we have to make a discrimination between TSP and DSP models. Whether the root of the series is equal to one or whether it is less than one whether the series is integrated or not. And that is the significance of the unit root test. Now, I shall tell you some history about the unit root test. The first ever attempt at a unit root test was done by Nelson and Prosser in 1982 using the augmented Dickey Fuller unit root test. Their null hypothesis was that a time series belongs to different stationary process class against the alternative hypothesis that it is a TSP, trend stationary process. And they carried out the augmented Dickey Fuller test on 14 US macroeconomic time series. And they found that 13 out of the 14 belong to the DSP class. The only exception was the unemployment range. These are the variables that they used. That is real GDP, nominal GDP, real per capita GNP, industry production, employment, unemployment range. Unemployment range was the only one where we reject the unit root null hypothesis. All others do not reject the unit root null hypothesis. 
So this Nelson Poulsen data, this particular data, data set, data set has become a guinea pig for all the unit root test makings. All of them use the, this particular data set. Now see the sample size. For example, industrial production, they have used the 111 annual data. In all the cases, they were using the annual data. Consumer prices, more than a century. Velocity of money, that also more than a century. And so, so naturally we know that there is some problem with the data sets. There may be some break in the series, especially when we are using large data sets, say 111. We have, we have data for industry production during the period of the Great Depression also. And Great Depression is a break point. And that is how Perron later on came criticizing Nelson Plosser's research, telling that the this problem, the non-stationarity research that we they go is actually a misleading one because if there is a break in the time series, then that can generate a pseudo non-stationarity. So the non-stationarity that Nelson and Prosser found in most of these time series, according to Perron, was because there was or there might be a break in this series. So then a lot of other studies are so found and uh, Perron came out with a new unit root test with the break and he used the, the exogenous break. So he used the chunk test and then there came endogenous break, endogenous break test and so on. We have a large number of unit root tests these days, including recognizing the break. So, in general, if we have a non-stationary series, then we have to run the regression in first differences. And this is the procedure used in the classical ARIMA model. So, they see whether there is a, there is a unit root in the, in the series. And if there is, then they will difference the series. And on the difference, with the different series, they will do the estimation in terms of the ARIMA. Or we have another method that is we check for co-integration among the series because we have some problems with the difference. So in, in the classical approach, we have to difference the series and later econometricians found that there, there are some pro problems with the difference. What are those problems? By differencing, actually, we are losing something. What are we losing? We are losing the we are losing the long run information. So the modern econometricians told they are telling us that solving the non stationarity problem via differencing is equivalent to throwing the baby out with the bath water because. Differencing results in valuable long run information being lost. So we will get the long run information, valuable long run information only, only if we do the regression with the level variables y t on x t. If we differentiate and do a regression of delta y t on delta x t. What we are getting is a short run regression, not a long run regression. And in a short run regression, we do not have the long run information. That is the problem. Now, most of the economic financial relationships in theory are given in terms of long term relationships, not in terms of short run ones between the variables in their levels, not in their differences. We say that consumption expenditure depends on income. V 
we do not tell that change in consumption expenditure depends on change in income. So we have the long-term relationships among most of the economic and financial relationships. So we are faced with two seemingly irreconcilable objectives. We have to avoid spurious regression of the integrated variables. At the same time, we have to conserve the long-term relationship. If we want to conserve the long-term relationship, we have to regress, have to have a regression with the level variables only. But the level variables are integrated variables and a regression with the integrated variables will be a spurious regression. So we have an irreconcilable problem. If we want to avoid spurious regression, then we will, we will not be conserving the long-term relationship. If we want to conserve the long-term relationship, then we will have a spurious regression. That is the problem. So what we have to do? And because of this came the new concept of co-integration. That is, suppose we have two variables, yt and xt. yt may be deterministic or integrated. Non, that is, deterministic means stationary, integrated means non-stationary. Similarly, xt also can be stationary and non-stationary. If we have both yt and xt stationary variables, then we have a valid regression. Otherwise, in all the cases, we will be getting spurious regression. If one or both the variables are integrated, then we will be getting spurious regression. But if both the variables are integrated, then we have a qualification. The regression will be spurious unless they are co-integrated. That means if yt and xt, both integrated series, if they are co-integrated, then the level variable regression between the two will not be spurious. That is the case. That is co-integration. Okay. Now, what is this co-integration? Suppose we have two variables, income and consumption. Both are increasing over the time and both are, both are non-stationary variables. Now, if we get a linear combination between income and consumption. What, is, what will be the linear combination between income and consumption? For example, income minus consumption. That is savings, right? So we have a linear combination of the two non-stationary variables. This savings also may be non-stationary, but in some cases, some contexts, the linear combination savings may be stationary. If the linear combination is stationary, then we say that income and consumption are co-integrated. In that case, we can have a valid regression with the income and consumption in the level variable itself. We need not go for difference. That is the idea of co-integration. That is, if a linear combination of two non-stationary series becoming stationary, then we have the case of co-integration. Now, in this particular case, the two variables are moving almost together. And that togetherness tell us that they are co-integrated. That is, co-integration also implies that the position of one variable will tell us the position of the other variable. So at any level here, 
the position of consumption will tell us the position of the intermediate. And that is cointegration. So if two variables are non-stationary, they seem to move together if they are cointegrated. So this concept of cointegration was put forward by Granger in 1981. This combines both the short run and long run perspectives. So if there is an equilibrium relationship between two economic variables, they may deviate from the equilibrium in the short run, but they will adjust towards the long run, towards the equilibrium in the long run. That is the concept of co-integration. That is, it is a stationary combination of non-stationary vari variables, as I have told you earlier. Actually, the interpretation of this one, that is, they may deviate from the equilibrium in the short run, but will adjust towards the equilibrium in the long, longer one, is the basis of Granger's representation theorem. That Granger's representation theorem in 1981 combines both the short run and the long run. And this is in terms of what is called an error correction mechanism. So this adjustment towards the equilibrium in the long run is the error correction. That error correction will lead us, lead the short run disequilibrium into the long run equilibrium. So that is the idea of Granger's 1981 representation theorem. Now, as I told you earlier, the same one, we have the data on income and consumption over a long period of time and their difference, that is the linear, linear combination of income and consumption, that is saving, also maybe upward trend, also maybe having an upward trend. But a property of I1 variables is that Sometimes their linear combination may be an I0 or stationary period. If it is so, then we can say that YT and XT are both cointegrated. So this I have already told you. Now we have two examples. The first one is, uh, is about a drunk and her dog an illustration of co-integration and error correction, written by Ore and published in the American Statistician in 1994. This is the case of a drunk woman, okay, and she has a dog. She is drunk, therefore she has a random walk. She is an integrated process. Her movement is an integrated process. The dog the dog's wandering also is a random walk. So its movement also is a non-stationary series, integrated one. So we have two random walk processes. But actually, these two will have a co-integration. How? Because both of them, both of them have random walks, even though the drunk woman is watering here and there and the dog also is watering here and there both of them will go together the the drunk woman will always will some some often will call see the dog's name is oliver okay so she will call oliver where are you oliver where are you hearing her voice the dog will come back to her and they will move together so whenever they drift apart, either the drunk will call Oliver or Oliver will sense the oh my master is drifting away from me. I have to be with her, otherwise she will she, she will what? She will do something. Okay. So the dog will go with the lot, even though both of them are in their random box. So this Article is available in the net. You can freely download it and have a reach. It gives this particular example very, very simple, very simple language, but with some equations.
Then after that came another article, a drunk her dog. Now a boyfriend also is added. An illustration of multiple co-integration and error correction by Smith and Harrison. This paper also is available in the net. You can have a you can have a happy reading of this also. So in this case, we have multiple co-integration. That is the drunk with her dog and with the dog into the drunk, then the drunk with her boyfriend, and then the drunk and the dog with the boyfriend. So we will we have multiple co-integration cases. So these cases I have already told you. Now what we have to do is suppose we have two variables yt and xt and there is a relationship between yt and xt given with this. Now if the if this ut that is yt minus beta xt is stationary that is if it is i0 then we can say that yt and xt are co-integrated. So the system will be in the long run. So that in the long in the long run, the average value of ut will be zero. So that yt will be equal to beta xt. We have the long run equilibrium. Okay, now so here we have the equilibrium error. The equilibrium sir the equilibrium error. Ah. Sir, uh, Come on. can you just go to the previous slide? Which one? This one? Sir, please uh, hold for a second. I'm just writing it down. Sir, please. Okay, 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 okay. So here I am telling that we have two non stationary variables yt and xt. And if a linear, if a linear combination of yt and xt, the linear is i0. Then there is co-integration between yt and xt. The linear combination we will get like this. That is ut equals yt minus beta xt. Okay. So in the framework of a regression, this means that first we regress yt or xt, get the residuals. The residual we are getting it from this. That is the original value of yt and the estimated value of yt. That is beta xt. So we are getting the residuals. So if the residuals are stationary, then yt and xt are co-integrated. And this beta is called the constant of integration. And this particular equation is called the co-integrating regression or co-integrating vector. Okay, shall I continue? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. okay. So here we have the equilibrium errors. The equilibrium error is a stationary one. So one way to test if there is a relationship between non-stationary data is to find if equilibrium errors return to zero. If long run relationship is there, then the errors must be a stationary series and they have a zero. Okay, this already we have, we have seen. This is, this we have already seen. See the concept of co-integration was introduced by Granger in 1981 and Engel and Granger in 1987. Also explained the concept of integration and then this Co-integration is used as a statistical property to describe the long-run behavior of economic time series. This we have already seen. Now, how can we distinguish between a genuine long-run relationship and a spurious regression? We need a test for that. That test is the co-integration test. So the co-integration test we have in different formats. The most popular one is the single equation residual based test given by Engel and Granger. Then we have a Darwin-Varson co-integrating regression test, but this is very rarely used. 
this is not available in any package types. Then the, the first one we can augment with the class the augmented angle creature test. Then we have a system method. The system method is given by Johansson and Jusserius. Therefore, this test is known as JJ test. This is a likelihood ratio test. We have two tests here, the trace test and the maximum eigenvalue test. I shall tell about the JJ test in the context of the package when that is during our uh, workshop. And here, I will tell you about the augmented angle Granger test. That is the residual based single equation test. So, for the residual based test, what we have to do is this. After estimating the model, we save the residuals from the static regression. That is, we use the level variable by t and xt, get the residuals, and consider whether the residuals are stationary. So, we can have the classical method of floating the residuals and getting the ACF, the core log. And in this case, the residuals appear to be stationary because the ACF, all the ACF are within the 95% confidence interval. The chronogram, both the chronogram and the, the float show that the residuals are stationary. So that is the classical one. Then we can do it with the unit test also. So we have the three steps. Test that both the variables have the same order of integration. That is say that they are both I1. So now one precondition for the point integration test is that we should have the same order of integration for all the variables. All the, vari all the variables that we consider must be either I1 or they all must be I2 and so on. So the order of the point integration must be the same. That is one limitation of this, this, this sort of the JJ test as well as not only the JJ test as it is so with the residual based single equation test also. So all the variables must have the same order of integration. So this we can do with the unit root test. Now estimate a long run relationship by YMS. That is with the with the level variables. And then get the residuals and see whether the residuals have a unit root. If the residuals do not have a unit root, then that means if they have a unit root, that means there is no co-integration. If there is no unit root in the residuals, then we have the case of co-integration. So this is how we do the residual based test. So here I am ending the discussion. The JJ test and all other things I shall show you during the workshop. Thank you. Any, any sir, sir, any questions from this? Now, uh, before, yeah. Before that, no, I think before that we have something else. So I am, uh, I am just recapping everything. So most of the macroeconomic variables are non-stationary. If we have a non-stationary problem, the consequence is that we are getting spurious regression with the level variables. We have two approaches, classical and modern. The diagnosis for non-stationarity for the classical one is the ACF test. That is the core logarithm. Then, of course, we have some statistical tests also for the classical methods that I have taken up. For the modern one, we have the unit root test. Then the solution for the classical one is differencing. For the modern one, of course, we use the differencing, but mainly we use point integration. 
if coin regression is not possible, then we go for the difference. Then the estimation procedures are for the classical, we have the Arima modeling by or the post Jenkins methodology, and also we have multivariate Arima modeling suggested by Harvey. That is very much. Then on the other side, modem, we have a large number of cases. We have one model suggested by Sims, the US one. Then we have the VCM, vector error correction model, suggested by the Nutton School of Economics, Sargent, Davidson, and Henry, and so on. And also Henry has the London School of Economics methodology called the GETS, that is general to specific methodology. So the we have these methodologies in general, that is the general to specific model, the LSE approach or the Henry David's approach. Then we have the vector autoregression model bar suggested by Sims, and this was the the dominant approach in the USA one time. Then we have the VECM, and this follows the Granger representation theorem. And VECM was the dominant approach used in the European continents in general earlier. And there was very heated exchanges, controversy between the USA econometricians and the European econometricians one time over the superiority of war or VEC. A large number of articles are there on this particular controversy. So I am stopping here. We can have some discussion. So we can have some discussion. A anybody have some uh, questions or queries you can ask right now. Hello, sir. Ah, um. Sir, uh, you said that uh, first of all, we need to check the stationarity of the series that we are going to basically yeah. use in regression. And if we find that they are uh, non stationary and having the same order of integration, we should go for in co integration. Yeah. Right. And in that, in that term, we need to use the basic OLS method. If they are found yeah. that they are That's integrated of the same order. Yeah. Sir, right. uh, uh, other than OLS, can we uh, use the fixed effects or random effects? Those models that those are used in static panel or those models in this mechanism? No, 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 no. See, the problem is for the uh, you are referring to the panel data, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, for the panel data, we have different panel data unit group tests. We have a large number of panel data unit tests. We have to do that. Similarly, the co-integration, we have different panel data co-integration tests that we have to do. Unfortunately, in Gretel, these are not available, but these are available in eViews and Startup. eViews and Startup. We can do that. So in the this these are possible only in time series. Panel data is different. So in panel data, we have separate unit root test and co-integration. We have to do it separate. This we cannot do there. That is ADF, PP, KP, KP, SS, all these tests are not possible in. We cannot use the panel data to these tests. Separate packages are then available. In, in otherwise, we go to R and download the programs, panel data unit root programs, or so integration programs. We can do that. Unfortunately, it is not available in Gretti, but some 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 small programs are available for I think for the panel data co integration. Uh, one or one I think one test, but uh, sometimes that that is not working properly. I know right that. But it is it is safer to go for stata or units in that case. Okay, sir. Yeah. So anybody else?
it's good that uh, most of you know the concepts already. So my part was very easier in that case. Thank you all for that. Huh. Okay, sir. If we don't no questions, uh, we can okay. go for lunch. Uh, yeah. Anybody? Any questions? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, sir. No questions, sir. So we can uh, wind up for lunch, and we will come back uh, two thirty, two thirty p.m. That was updated okay. in the uh, schedule. So uh, two thirty yeah. p.m. We will come back again. Four hands on practices. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Yes, sir. I'm stopping the recording now. Okay. Okay.